planning an event and wondering how you can give your attendees the best experience possible? Take advantage of customized meetings with Hilton that make it easier than ever to incorporate health, wellness, and great breaks. Hilton will help you build an extraordinary meeting that attendees will remember. To book your next meeting or event, go to meetings.hilton.com. Welcome to Gather Geeks, a podcast by BizBash, the place where people passionate about meetings and events come together. Here are your hosts, BizBash CEO David Adler and Editor-in-Chief Beth Kormanick. Hi, David. Hey, Beth, here we are, another Gather Geeks podcast. Today, we're kicking off a new series of Gather Geeks interviews called Sparking Change. David, describe the concept for us and what listeners can expect. Well, we're working with this group called Skipster to create these photo montages of the great uh, event organizers around North America and in actually in London and Toronto and in Washington this time, where we're actually... Uh, taking photographs of them and also having podcasts with them to talk about how they spark change with their meetings and events. Because after all, isn't that what we're trying to do in many cases? Change people's perspective on things. People gather for a particular reason. And many times the reason is to change the way they look at something, to buy something, to, to be interested in something. And so we're trying to find out what really makes that tick. And uh, Natalie is the perfect example of one of those people. Well, let's introduce her. First up is Natalie Jones, the Meridian International Center's Senior Vice President for External Affairs and the former Deputy Chief of Protocol at the U.S. State Department. And also joining the conversation is Alex Carter of Skipster. He'll be co-moderating with you, David. So we'll be hearing his voice as well. So with Sparking Change, is this really a a results-oriented concept? Uh, Yeah, it's sort of like using these masters and figuring out behind the scenes, what they think about when they plan their meetings and their events and create their pageants in a sense. It's kind of the idea. Finally, I'll add that co-moderating with you, David, is Alex Carter of Skipster. So we're going to be hearing his voice as well. So you came as the, you were the deputy chief of protocol. Yes. We actually worked together. I was yes. a voluntold. A voluntold. <laughs> you were a vol- voluntold, but you were really like our, our guardian angel, David. Uh, <laughs> really. But we had an incredible time at the State Department. Talk about what the protocol office di- did and does. Hopefully it still yeah, does the it, same it, thing. It sure does. And, and also then we'll go into some of the programs that, that gave you goosebumps because we're talking about sparking change, but you literally literally were there on the stage watching change happen before your eyes. I was, yeah. Uh, before that, I want, to, I want Alex to tee this up a little bit. Sure. So just a little bit more about sparking change and what that means in the context of events is that we have a really interesting subject here where we have events that you have someone's attention captured, you have them there, you have them in the moment, and you have a a real-time access to that person. And it's a really good opportunity to send a message, to inspire them to act, to motivate them in some way. But then the question of sparking change, really, is how do you make that translate when the doors close and the lights go out and they go home? And what happens afterwards? You know, what are the tools? What are the methodologies? What's the mindset going into taking an event and leading to impact that's bigger? So tell us, uh, make us like have such event envy for one of the things that you've been working on over the last uh, many years. Yeah. So um, I worked as deputy chief of protocol at the State Department, and it was, I think, I the most incredible opportunity of my life to be able to serve the United States and represent the United States in every single program and event that we hosted was representative of the United States. No pressure at all. But tell us a little bit yeah. about the types of events and what that job meant. What that it, job meant. People, yeah. people will be blown away. Yeah. So, so what that meant was that my boss, I actually had three bosses, was the president, the vice president, and the secretary of state. And they were our host. And our jobs were to uh, any time a foreign dignitary was coming to the United States, any time that they were traveling abroad, our job was to make sure that 
um, the events were representative of our host. Um, it made our foreign dignitaries feel welcome. And most important, that it set the stage really for diplomacy, for diplomacy to take place, for negotiations to happen, for tough conversations to happen, for relationships um, to flourish. Um, and um, we did that in, in so many ways, whether it was making sure that uh, a bilateral meeting was uh, was set up the right way. Explain to most people yep. what a bilateral meeting is. Oh, bilateral meeting is is when uh, when you hear that uh, the uh, the the prime minister of the UK is coming to visit the president, then they have a meeting, and it's called a bilateral meeting. There's so much There's terminology. Two it's two countries, and they're trilateral meetings. We would do meetings with three delegations, whether it was uh, U.S. India and Pakistan, uh, U.S., uh, Korea, Japan, and then we would do summits. And summits were the, they were the Super Bowl of, of diplomacy, when we would have 60 delegations, 60 heads of state coming to the United States. Um, we needed to make sure that uh, that we not only, um, that we looked after each and every one of our guests. So imagine just having an event literally with 80 heads of state, with 80 different needs, with, um, trying to take into account how do we, um, how do we represent our hosts and how do we represent the United States, but also being very, um, cognizant of our guests needs and what their, their preferences are. Everything from what are we serving them? Um, a lot of these leaders were hopping off of a plane. Their time, you know, their, their, uh, time clocks were always out of whack. So we always had coffee. That was something we always, always had coffee, always had tea. It was understanding preferences. Some leaders, uh, were, were coffee drinkers. Some were tea drinkers, understanding those details. So at the end of the day, we wanted to make sure that they were completely comfortable. They felt completely respected. Um, and you know, that, Honestly, I think it helps, um, that helps our, our president, our vice president, our secretary when they're, they're having those tough conversations. Well, you can spark it's, change when people are in the mood to you, even think about change. That's, that's exactly, that's exactly right. So providing, so mm -hmm. thinking about our settings of where these meetings would take place. You know, when, um, uh, Secretary Clinton, um, loved hosting um, hosting her visitors, not necessarily at the State Department, but at restaurants around Washington and really to have this kind of personal um, connection. But that was still an event. We still needed to think through all of kind of the mechanics and logistics and everything, um, you know, if it even was a two-person. An event for us could be a um, a 500 person summit to a two person one on one bilateral meeting. And each one was just as important. Um, and, and each one is leading toward some sort of change, you know, whatever those conversations, if, if a, um, for, for leaders, you know, in this age of technology, you would think that there would be less bilateral meetings, um, that there would be kind of less to this um, kind of face-to-face -face relationships, but there's actually even more. So for when leaders come to the United States and they're having these conversations, they're important. So but why do you think that that, like what happens? At what point do you see the, your, the eyes light up of the participants saying, oh, we're, we've got, we, something happened, something clicked? Something clicked. You know, I think... What I love seeing is when two, when President Obama or the secretary would meet a leader for the first time and developed a chemistry and developed a relationship. Um, for instance, um, when Prime Minister Cameron came to the United States, President Obama had met him just once or twice before. But when we thought through how we were going to approach his visit and all the associated events around it. We wanted to make sure that there was, uh, we, we set the stage for that chemistry to take place. So the two of them went to a basketball game together to an NCAA a double, um, uh, tournament. Um, they, uh, they, um, uh, went 
in what we call an OTR off the record um, uh, kind of stop just to have burgers between the two of them. And you can How tell by the end that? of it, that, it's, very that, it's very planned. It's, it's very like, planned. Oh, let's go get a burger. It's not supposed to look planned. <laughs> but um, you, you can tell at the end of the visit when those leaders are going back on their planes and they are just so thankful. You could tell that they're, um, they feel like they moved the ball forward, whether it was again, establishing that relationship, whether they, um, came to an agreement on, on an issue, but it's, it's, um, it, it it's pretty extraordinary. But you're standing there in yep. view of what's going on in most cases. Yes. Do you actually see it happening? Do you have, is there the body language shift? Is there something that you have sort of learned over the years that you see when that happens? Is it at the basketball game at halftime? And for that matter, uh, going off David's point too, are there any tells or moments when you feel there needs to be real time intervention? Do you know, okay, this is a moment I need to step in and change course? Yeah, there are a lot of times when there have just been breaks when it's like, okay, unexpected break. We thought that the, din you know, lunch or dinner was going to take place to two and a half hours and, you know, maybe something wasn't going kind of as planned and okay, we would get the kind of wave, we would get the wave in. Okay. We need to get, you know, both sides need to, to have a moment. They need to review. So we would see a lot of that. Um, you go in and intervene. We go, we, we would, someone usually, we, we were expert door watchers, expert door watchers. So a lot of times, you know, we would get everything set up. We would make sure everyone gets seated. Everyone's comfortable. And then, you know, a lot of closed door conversations. And then we're always trying to figure out when is it going to break? When is it going to break? And then the door flings open and it's one of the aides or sometimes the, the, the secretary or the vice president or president himself and say, okay, okay, everyone, we need to take a break. Um, so, uh, sometimes that would happen earlier than we, we, we thought it would. Sometimes then how do, it would what do you go do? long and long and long. I remember we, um, I was lucky enough. This is one of the pinch me mo moments. I was, um, had the honor of traveling to the Vatican with the president to meet Pope Francis. And those visits are, um, just so formulaic, you know, the, the one on one, um, between the, the leader and, and the Pope. It's usually half an hour. This took, they were there for 45, 50 minutes and it was unheard of. Um, so, um, it's, yeah. So, so you, I think a lot of the length of time kind of spent, um, you know, and, and again, we, you know, that's part but of was it. The personal chemistry between the people, does it all come down to the personal chemistry between the people at some point, or are you doing something to make the chemistry giving permission for the chemistry to work better? I think we're giving permission for the chemistry to work better. And again, those are a lot of just the small touches. And a lot of times we would, um, again, in protocol, our job was to think through how do you create that chemistry? What are, um, what are the small things that we can do, small and big things to, to, to show that our boss, our, our host was thinking about our guests again, whether what we served them, the gift that we gave them, yeah. the entertainment um, uh, that we presented, and just the reception. Did we have red carpet or not? A lot of countries notice. A lot of countries notice, you know, which kind of honors that they're accorded. Um, did we have an honor cordon? Um, who? So those are a lot of the the details that, you know, there are these small things that I think leaders and delegations and their staff they 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 pick up on. And if again, if they feel like, wow, and impressed, um, and we want to impress all of our guests, I think that just, you know allows them to be in a better position. But, but it, it, I, I believe that one of the things that in the event industry in general is there's a movement towards intentional humanism. And intentional humanism is not something that just happens. That you have these little things, the, you know, the right chef and the right food and the right atmosphere and the right accoutrement, setting the stage for diplomacy, as we call it, right. is important. Right. But it's no less important in a corporate event. 
It's that's and you're seeing that here at the Meridian House, too. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And really, you know, we look at events as we're I see Meridian as a collaboration. We'll talk about Meridian in a second, yeah, because we have to do tee this yes, up. Okay, but gotcha. I wanted to do is touch on uh, some of the things that these small things that we that you really took seriously, it's like gifting. Uh, gifting tell us yeah. a little bit about everything from the small intentional the bow dog that I that I yeah. dealt with and the types of gifting and how gifting worked in terms of these sort of like making sparking change through humanism so we we took our gifts very seriously and it was really a reflection we saw it as a reflection um, of of how and I think a lot of guests see it as how their host uh, sees them. So we did a lot of research. Every single leader that came through, we would research their background, um, what their interests were, um, what were things that could, um, y- you know, that could really kind of spark, wow. And so what are well some of the examples of. So, of the things that were really well thought and well crafted? I know yeah. the first day that I was involved, we did the tree branches from the uh, White House, old wood from the White House, yeah, and creating so, art out of that. Yeah, so um, we would, um, you know, and everything, again, that we, we, we see as a view of how do we display America? How do we how do we showcase the best of America? How do we highlight American crafts, men and women? How do we showcase American materials? But just an example, um, we had President Hollande um, come in for a state visit and um, the the purpose of the visit, and this is another What's, what thing. What country is this so everybody? France, okay. sorry. <laughs> Fran- uh, Francois, sure. yeah. Francois Hollande of France um, come for a state visit and um, the, the purpose of the visit, and it's really always, um, I always have to stop and everyone should always stop and ask themselves why. Why is this meeting taking place? Why is this visit taking place? Why is this country so important to the U.S. relationship? But the the visit was really to underscore the U.S.-France cooperation on a number of matters, NATO, military, economic, and we really wanted to highlight that relationship. And one of, um, uh, so we uh, designed this beautiful table for President Olan made out of magnolia wood. And the, the magnolia tree came from the White House grounds. And it had a, it was designed by a furniture maker from Chicago, the president's hometown. And in the center of the table was a replica of the key um, of, of Lafayette. And it was just this very symbolic, um, symbolic gift. Um, another example was when we uh, designed a gift for Pope Francis. And, you know, Pope Francis was really, in, in, in pre, you know, we always go back to gifting history. What have we given? We never want to give the same thing twice. You know, you think about kind of, you know, how you approach gifts in your normal day-to-day, you know, kind of day-to-day life. Um, but for previous popes, we would give a lot of very um, kind of uh, gifts with uh, relics. They were, um, you know, perhaps objects that were a few times removed from a saint. Um, but this this pope was very different. You know, he, um, he had just been... Um, uh, installed. He, you know, there was this, this hope and optimism and, uh, this openness to him. So we designed a, a seed chest that had seeds from the White House garden. And we made a donation, um, a very, very large, substantial donation to a charity, um, on his behalf. And it was this, um, really beautiful moment when President Obama was presenting the gift to the Pope in person and said, these are seeds from our white, you know, from the garden and, um, invited him to come to the white house. And he did a year later. And, um, so it's, it's a lot of research. It's a lot of, um, also thinking about, um, 
you know, just again, as you would for like a, a person that you're gifting, have you met the person before? If it's maybe a new person, maybe you don't want to go so strong and personal and deep right away. Um, but you know, as, especially as, um, uh, you know, as our bosses would meet leaders multiple times, we really had to become creative. So we didn't give, um, you know, so each gift was distinct from the others. Yeah. So I want to touch on a theme that's come up in a couple of these stories, which it sounds like the successful execution of this really hinges on good research, probably great research, yes. even excellent research. Yes. So I want to hear your thoughts on what you think goes into excellent research to be able to get that level of depth of background and to understand not only what you need to do, but also the why of what you're doing it to get to the outcomes that matter for meetings like this. Yeah. So I think, um, it, 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 Absolutely is. And I think what was um, even more interesting at the State Department, it wasn't that we, we focus on one country or one region or one issue. I always say we were generalists. And so we were forced every time a leader um, was in the U.S. or there was another summit or treaty, we had we had to be experts on the topic. And we had to, I think, first and foremost, know who those other experts were and kind of create kind of almost a small kitchen cabinet each time we had a leader visit. And that usually consisted for us, it was the desk officer, it was the ambassador here in Washington, the ambassador at Post, because the, the second thing I um, learned was you need to trust, but you need to verify <laughs> because there was a lot sometimes of different um, different information and you needed to reconcile and you needed to know who had um you know, what information to take with a grain of salt and who had the best kind of information and, and really being able to have that kitchen, um, you know, you have that kitchen cabinet, but again, um, you need to kind of use judgment on who was there, you should was, follow. Did you find any sort of commonalities among the ones that you can trust and not trust? You know, we, re you know, we realized the, the, um, our, our folks who were abroad, who are at post, who are at the embassy abroad, they had the best sense of what was going on because they were in country, they were in the ground, you know, on the ground. And what I realized too about diplomacy and at the State Department, everything is one big game of telephone, right? Of, of distilling information down. So let's say, um, you know, we hear, um, you know, uh, you know, the, let's just, again, hypothetical, the, um, uh, you know, the president of France likes X or, um, wants X, Y, or Z. He will communicate that down to his aide. That aide will then tell, um, someone at the foreign ministry, the foreign ministry will provide that information to our post, um, in Paris. Our folks who are working at Embassy Paris will translate that information to our desk officer, which will get to us. So by the time some of this information kind of gets distilled down, it gets distorted. And what we think that the leader likes or wants is not necessarily the case because everyone has their kind of different um, version or perspective. So everything, it's, it's really... Um, you know, it, it, so to go as close to the source as possible is the best. Well, Whenever we were able to have a president's aide to understand, okay, so what does he really like? Coffee or tea? Or what does he really, um, you know, is, or, or understanding, is he conversational or is she conversational in English? You know, we would always be able to get it right from the president's aide. But if we relied on information that kind of trickled down, it was not necessarily. So, you know what this does point out to me, and I, and I, you know, Master Marshall, mm -hmm. that the job of chief of protocol, deputy chief of protocol, in these countries are so underestimated in terms of yeah. the value because they're yeah. the ones with the ear of the leader exactly. and they know the human side of what's going on. So I think yeah. that, that people are making a huge mistake when they discount 
the protocol people for not being policy people. Right. Because you have to understand the dynamics. You have to understand when you're doing seating, <clears throat> you don't want to sit Russia and Georgia together. You might think twice about sitting Pakistan and India together. You need to know the context of, um, of, you know, so much of the geopolitical kind of landscape going on. And right, leaders, um, you know, you, you Chiefs of protocol, I think, are privy to a lot of information. But it's no most... different than the event organizer in a big corporation That's... with the with the with the ear of the of the boss or the CEO. That's exactly right. So there's right. absolutely so so it's kind of thing when sparking change that the people closest to the human side of power kind of becomes um, one of the new barometers, I believe. We're going to take a little break and come right back after this message from Hilton. So when's the big event? Hilton's here for planners with their exclusive customized meetings. Become a wow maker and save time by letting Hilton help you present an extraordinary event, one that leads to memorable and meaningful connections. Visit meetings.hilton.com and let Hilton help you. So let's move on yeah. to the Meridian yeah. um, Center. Meridian House is what it's called. Meridian International Center. Meridian International Center. Yes which has become a mini version of the State Department in many ways. You're doing some of the same missions on a yeah. private, public basis. That's exactly and right. And a lot of the people that worked at the State Department under the protocol department I know best are now here. Yeah. Give us a little um, sort of prim prim primer on how Sparking Change and Meridian House go together so well, why we're doing the photo shoot right here as well. Yeah. So, um, and, and just for background, Meridian International Center is a diplomatic and global leadership institution, and we strengthen U.S. engagement with the world through exchange, exchange of people, exchange of ideas, exchange of culture, and um, a, a huge component of our work. I mean, everything is, everything is human-centered. We bring 4,000 leaders to the United States every year to connect with their American counterparts to get a better understanding of the United States and to eventually uh, go back to their countries to become the change makers and to have a understanding of American values and um, how our government works and to have counterparts in the United States that they can turn to when they're working on an issue. We've had 180 presidents and prime ministers who've been alumni of our organizations. But so that's the peop, the kind of the people component, but a large component now is our ideas pillar. So we're not a think tank. We believe that more perspectives lead to better policy. And we've become this powerful convener of connecting the diplomatic community with U.S. government and the private sector to accelerate collaboration on global issues because we believe that there are gaps that exist between those three communities. And every week we are working on events and programs to help accelerate this collaboration. So um, the question that I have is, you said the word events to help the collaboration. Yes. Why are events so perfect to spark change? I think events, because I think change happens at the human level. Change happens at the human level. Which is the level. theme of this whole entire it's, conversation. We it's, have. and, um, and why I think events, we, so the way that we approach events is that we, we're not doing big, large events. We are doing very thoughtful, purposeful programs and a huge focus is curating who's in the room because we, um, we find that many times that it takes an event to bring people together from, um, from different perspectives across parties, across borders, um, across industries. And, you know, especially now, um, as you look at, you know, social media, people gravitate toward what's comfortable to them and what they know. And I think it takes events that's the catalyst for bringing people together that maybe normally wouldn't, um, uh, you know, wouldn't normally meet. So um, that's a, a huge component of our of our events is curating the audience. So okay, so you bring these people with disparate views together. Yeah. Um, as you know, I'm a big proponent of this concept called "How do you be a collaboration artist?" Yes. What yes. do you do? 
when you bring, what, what are the techniques and tools that you use to spark change in the room? Yeah. So I think the, 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 the first thing is that we, we've set up Meridian to be a safe place. So I think people know that when they're coming to Meridian, we're neutral, we're nonpartisan. So they're not coming and walking into the room on the offensive or on the defensive. So I think that's kind of number one. Um, number two, we have this amazing venue that feels um, that just when people walk in for the first time, they feel like that they're in an embassy. They feel like they're a place that's important. They feel like it's civilized. It's a little bit even, um, while we're, we're in Washington proper, we're a little bit removed from the hustle and bustle of, um, of downtown, of Capitol Hill. Um, so I think that kind of just sets the tone. And I think that that's e extremely important. The, the, the third is we, um, you know, as we, um, kind of uh, look at our event formats. You know, we're so veering away from the panel discussions, you know, where it's very, um, you know, one sided is that we just really want engagement and, um, we'll, we'll experiment with different formats. One we've found that's really, um, it's really well worked well for us is a catalyst format where, um, and again, everything that we're doing in all of these programs, we're providing people with relationships and insight. So our catalyst speakers, whether they're speaking on uh, trade or national security or, or global health, they're, they're um, kind of giving information in short digestible bits, but then they're hosting, they're the table host, um, and they'll really lead a conversation and we will have um, prepared everyone in advance. Everyone knows um, in advance who's going to be in the room, their biographies. So then it helps. So, so even before people walk into Meridian, they're kind of getting into the mindset of, oh, okay, wait, I worked on this issue. Um, oh, this person worked on this issue. So did I. I went to school with this person. Um, we served in the administration together. So already we're starting to get, um, kind of areas of, um, you know, kind of, a, of alignment. Is this, people. uh, the sort of, the, if you had to trademark the type of meeting, is it like a Jeffersonian style dinner or event? We do, and that's an, that's another, another format. But what is the catalyst format? What does it look the like? So the catalyst, so the catalyst format um, is usually in, um, we have four or five round tables. It's, you know, I think it's great for a group of 40 to 50 people. So you have four to five catalyst speakers, um, and then they each host a table. We also, another great format we use are the Jeffersonian style salon dinners. And, you know, you, and I, I know you say it all the time, but breaking bread is the ultimate, uh, way to bring people together. And I think people don't stop it's in this kind of hustle and bustle. Everyone goes to a reception and you network and you meet people and you have these like three minute conversations, you know, we're, we're, uh, you know, we think that this salon style dinner where you, people can one relax, have a glass of wine, get to know each other before they sit down for dinner and then really have uh, this dialogue that's facilitated and I have the, our, our CEO, um, and president ambassador Stuart holiday is this brilliantly skilled moderator where he can start a conversation. He has, everyone goes around the table and introduces themselves sometimes, uh, you know, kind of asks a, a, a question to kind of spark conversation, but to keep kind of the topic, um, going and to bring people in again, he's doing his research in advance of, of the conversation to bring in different perspectives, to bring in drawn people's experience, um, knows when to kind of have the whole table part of a conversation and then when to also break and have people who are seated next to each other. Seating is huge for us and, and really being thoughtful and strategic and purposeful about um, how we see people to, to spark those connections and spark change. Because David, I go back to what you told me, the power of let's. And if you can have people 
who can walk away from a program and just say, let's, let's meet, let's work on that. Let's move that issue forward. That's a success for us. That's a win for us. And, and just on that last point of moving forward and moving past the event itself, uh, do you have any insight or tips or anything you'd like to share about how after the people have left the room, then you can see that success starting to take place. What, what are the things you look for to know that that worked? You know, I, I love when I get, um, emails the next day saying, Hey, do you have this person's contact information? You know, we, we had such a great conversation, uh, and want to keep working together. So, um, we're, we're, distributing everyone's contact information with their permission, of course, because we want people to keep in touch. I think the most gratifying um, uh, uh, things that I see after an event, and sometimes it's a year or two or three years later, is that I see um, maybe it's two friends or two, you know, kind of two contacts that I know and they're really good friends. And they're like, oh yeah, we're working on this. I'm like, how did you guys meet each other? It's like, oh, we met that state luncheon or we met at, uh, you know, the Meridian ball, or we met at, um, so many other events. I'm like blown away. I mean, I love, there's like nothing nothing better better, except maybe having two people meet each other and maybe get married or like have a baby and everything. But it is like so, so, so gratifying. So one to, you know, to, 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 you know, con- continue that connectivity. But then we also see like our events are not necessarily in a vacuum. Like we are, you know, I think what makes Meridian unique is that we're, we're building community. Like we want people who, um, when they come to our programs and events, there's kind of this regular cadence and they get to know people. Um, there's always new people, but they're, they're walking into a room and there's, um, there's some familiarity. And, um, we have this, um, uh, amazing group called the Meridian Global Leadership Council. And it's, uh, just a, a number of community leaders, um, business leaders, maybe former government officials who, um, support the work that we do. They believe that the U S is stronger at home when we're globally engaged. And, um, it's amazing to see this network come together because of these shared experiences. And, um, I've seen friendships blossom. I've seen relationships blossom. I've seen, um, uh, partner, you know, public private partnerships, business partnerships. I mean, you name it. You know, so, the, we had another guest recently on our podcast here on this topic and it struck me what she said. And I asked her, what was the ROI? And she said, love. Love. Oh, I, I love. And when yeah, you love. think about it, it makes sense yeah. in the real sense that that's what you're creating this um, community that has a certain intimacy yes. that people become friends. They use the the really, really, really sort of smart strategy of fun. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that's an and that's another big component, I think, of our like, w- like, what's the Meridian special sauce, right? Like, there are a lot of organizations that have policy discussions, and they're, and they're talking about some Deadly. very <laughs> serious <laughs> topics of sanctions, and, you know, TPP, and you name it. And we do that. But there's also a social component that is equally as important to those conversations. It's equally, um, you know, and, and I think why we're so successful is people get to know each other in a different way over a meal, over, over, um, over cocktails. And another kind of part of our special sauce is culture. And that's like the third kind of pillar I talked about exchange of people, ideas, culture is that we use culture as this, um, as this way to connect people where sometimes talking about just for, you know, just to give an example, um, every year we do a great event in partnership with the Chinese embassy around Chinese, uh, lunar new year. And, you know, our relationship with China is really difficult right now, but it's amazing that we're able to, um, bring together people, um, uh, from both, you know, high level officials from both the, the Chinese side and the American side through culture and to, 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 to see performances, to, to, to really kind of be par- part of the shared experiences. So that's another kind of 
unique kind of that that kind of a third a third leg for us. You know, one of the things that uh, the, the through line through this whole thing is this humanism that's mm-hmm. being created, and the fact that while we're talking about this high tone heads of state and really you know brilliant thinkers. There's no difference between an ecosystem and a corporate event strategy around a brand or a, or a community than dealing with the president of the United States and it really the Pope. Isn't. And what you're sort of expressing is sparking change happens at any level. At, at any level. We're all at the most basic level. You know, I think everyone wants to feel welcome. They want to feel respected. They want to feel um, that they're having fun, that they, um, that there's this kind of, uh, you know, there's, it's, it's, it's true. And that's why I love, and that's why I love again about, um, creating these events. I mean, creating, seeing this chemistry kind of in action. And yeah, I think that's, I think that's where we're, we're moving toward for, for all of our programs. We're going to end on two notes. Okay. First, I want to end on, um, the first part is, Event organizers need to eat, drink, think inspiration day and night. Yeah. What inspires you when you to create better events? Like what do you what in your life? What are you, what are your fashion tastes? What are your food tastes? What are your cultural tastes personally? Yeah, I think that, that are happening now. That are happening now. Well, I'm I'm so lucky to be in Washington and I'm able to go to all these amazing embassies. Um and it's a window into every country in the world. So there's so many kind of techniques that I'll draw from embassies on how they entertain on, you know, I was just at the ambassador of Morocco's residence and she had this most amazing, amazing um, spread of Moroccan food and the way that it was presented just sparked, oh my gosh, we should do that. You know, so I think that's, I, I draw a lot of inspiration from, from the embassies that I, um, are, a, that I'm able to visit here. Um, another, uh, I think another, I'm trying to think of other like great, um, well, like in terms of, um, in terms of fashion, what have you seen in the world of fashion? Oh, uh, I love fashion. But what I is your, fashion. like, what do you, what do you, you know, you I did buy? another fashion diplomacy event. I know. I that's know. why I'm bringing this uh, up. Yeah. But so, like, who do you like look at to give you inspiration personally? Don't think about it. Too Don't, much. I'm just not going to think about it. You know what? I am a serial fashion Instagrammer. I follow all of the street kind of big street fashion, um, stars. And I love that there's this more kind of relaxed, um, kind of, uh, approach to fashion. And I think that's kind of translates to events where it's maybe not necessarily as formal that's and suits and kind of, and, and, uh, and, um, buttoned up. Um, so yeah. what about music? Music, <sighs> music. Um, what do you listen to? What's your oh favorite gosh, song today? I mean, it's almost embarrassing. I'm like a top 40 girl. That's okay. I'm a top 40 okay. girl. I'm That's a top okay. 40 girl. And you know what? I love, <laughs> here we go. Okay, I love dance truth. music. Okay. okay. Here's okay. okay. So here's, Tell so I the- just started and David, you should try this. Have you tried 305 fitness? No. OMG. Really? It's a, it's a hip hop oh, dance class. Wow. So I have learned to twerk and uh, I, I have <laughs> learned, to, I, I have learned to twerk and it is, it's amazing. It's like really high, um, high energy. I don't know anything that's uplifting. I love that's like true. having music, like uplifting. So- is twerking going to happen at Meridian? I don't else? think, well, you know it, it could because our ball, our, our, our it could happen on the dance floor at our ball. It could, oh, ha- yeah. Very good. It could, it could happen on good. the dance floor at our ball. It might not be me. It might be someone else. I'm going to turn the final question over to Alex. Sure. So now we've talked about inspiring other people to take action and bringing impact through events. From your perspective, if you could have one takeaway or one thing that you are known for, one change that you can personally make happen, what do you care about to change? Like what causes or what, uh, what, what drives you? Um, what drives me, I think is, um, I think that the United States is the greatest country in the world. You know, this, I, I've seen, um, my mother is from Santiago, Chile. She came to the United States, um, just, just really, um, idolized what, 
the American dream. And I think the American dream is, um, is at jeopardy and the way that our, um, our standing in the world, the way that, um, you know, other countries, I think, view us. I think that there's this generation that might not be looking at the United States the same way. So I think that's why I love Meridian. That's why I love the work that I did at the State Department. But I love Meridian because um, we're bringing leaders here um, from all over the world to, to see the real America. Um, and I think that's so that's so important that we have to um, kind of look at the long game um, and keep these important relationships uh, around the world intact. That's great. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right, we're back. David, thanks for that. One thing I found interesting in this conversation was her discussion of moving away from panels panel discussions, uh, which she called one-sided to favor some formats with more engagement. I found this one tricky because, you know, it's still a panel, all a discussion format is still something that that we use and, and I enjoy from time to time when I go to events, but you really have to trust your audience if you're going to go to a new model because we've we've all been to these uh, panels where they open it up to Q&A and you just have the person who goes on and on or asks a question that's not relevant or says... This is more of a comment than a question. <laughs> Those drive me nuts. Well, so you, yeah, you really have to trust your audience yes. to be able to yes. offer them that engagement and that they'll rise up to 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 offering a, a worthwhile um, discussion. Absolutely, and but I think that that's where this whole concept that I've been preaching forever called being a great collaboration artist comes into play, and that that is the skill that needs to be proliferated around our industry, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And I think there are things without totally dropping the panel discussion. There are ways that you can um, can have engagement. You know, a couple of years ago, we reported on this Bloomberg Link conference, and they uh, created a speakers lounge in the middle of the break area so that attendees could interact directly with the speaker. So you're you're you still have maybe a traditional format, but you're making them these speakers available to all of your attendees and having this engagement. You're providing access. And, and for that event, it made sense for this C-suite crowd because they expect that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Beth, what's going on at BizBash? So, you know, it's officially music festival season. And we know that because Coachella has kicked off. It started this past weekend and continues in the weekend to come. And Claire Hoffman from our editorial team has been on the ground. She already previewed the biggest brand activations and parties. And you can also get a visual teaser on our Instagram at BizBash. And full coverage will follow on BizBash.com. It is kind of a bonanza for a certain type of brand marketing uh and, and not just for millennial targeting companies, it's tech companies, it's kind of everyone wants to get a piece of the action there and and some of the buzz. So it's an, it's an important weekend for the event industry. It, it also spills over to every aspect of every different types of event because people look at it, you know, the whole purpose of BizBash is to allow people to peek over the fence to see what other people are doing. And it stimulates so many new ideas, whether you're doing a sales meeting or whether you're doing a wedding or whether you're doing an incentive trip, what's going on at the festivals is really cutting edge in many cases in the brand activations. Absolutely. So check out that coverage. Great. So before we end, we like to thank the people that helped make this uh, podcast possible. And, uh, well, we're going to thank Claire Hoffman again, who is has this terrible job of going Coachella, to Coachella this mm-hmm. week. Uh, but she handles all the editorial duties for our podcast. Dave Some, Nelson, somebody's got to do it, Somebody's got to do it. It's a rough job, I know. Like We, we get no sympathy for what we do. Uh, Dave Nelson is our producer, and uh, Rebecca Pappas is responsible for getting the podcast out to you. So with all that said, what do we end up with? Um, what do we say at the end here? Gather on. Gather on. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Player FM, Google Play, and Pocket Cast. Be sure to leave us a rating and review. It helps others discover the Gather Geeks podcast. We'd also love to hear from you. You can leave feedback on Twitter at Gather Geeks or leave us an email, gathergeeks at bizbash.com. We hope you'll join us again for the next episode of Gather Geeks. Until then, gather on. Gather on.